Uh, and we're very happy to have with us today our friends over at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO Regional Outreach Office uh, in Dallas, which covers Alabama, uh, Mr. Ronaldo or Ray Vasquez and Dimple Saparawala. And Ray, I'll turn it over to you all now. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Reynaldo Vasquez. You guys can call me Ray. I'm the Texas Regional Outreach Officer here for the USPTO Texas Regional Office. Uh, we do cover eight states. As Michael was saying, Alabama is part of the area that we cover, the certain the southern states. Uh, just a little bit by myself. I've been here with USPTO for about a year now. I come from the SBA world, so I used to do economic de development for about 11 and a half years. Before that, I used to work for DHS, ICE, and before that, I was with the U.S. Army. I'm actually still currently with the U.S. Army National Guard, finishing my time, and I'm happy to be here with USPTO, helping educate the uh, public on intellectual property and what USPTO does in, uh, throughout the year. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dimple. She'll be my co-presenter today, and, I'll, and after Dimple, Jacob, which will be supporting us today as well. Uh, Dimple? Good morning, everyone. My name is Dimple Sopariwala, and I'm with the USPTO for more than 15 years. Um, I joined the USPTO as an patent examiner. I examined applications in industrial chemistry as well as the chemical engineering backgrounds, like applicable material science and other devices. And um, trust me, during my examination time, I came across very beautiful patent inventions. Um, I examined for, uh, I was examiner for eight and a half years, and after that, USPTO is uh, one of the biggest patent office worldwide. So I want to explore the other side of the USPTO, and um, currently I'm working with the Classification Quality and International Outreach Coordinator. That's my permanent job roles. As a permanent job role, um, maintaining the classification quality, as well as the, we do the loss of international outreach activities. So when I say international outreach activities, we have lots of collaborations with the worldwide patent office. And uh, if they need any patent trainings or um, any classification trainings, we provide them, we teach them about the patent classification systems, as well as how to search uh, patent applications. And right now, um, this is my third month with the um, Texas Regional Office. I'm on a temporary um, working assignment with the Texas Regional Office. And first of all, I would like to say thank you to Michael for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to talk about more about the intellectual property to guide the, our stakeholders that what is the intellectual properties, how that can be beneficial to them when they have an innovative idea. So thank you so much, Michael, for inviting us. Now I would like to hand over to Jacob. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacob Choi. I'm the deputy director here at the USPTO Texas Regional Office. Um, we really welcome you guys to join us in this presentation and have you guys learn uh, just a, on a surface, learn about intellectual property that includes patents, trademark, copyright, and, copyright and trade secret. I think uh, earlier, Michael said it or put it in a right perspective. Um, we are, as a regional office, trying to demystify the process for filing the application as to as well as what is intellectual property. And I can tell you that in terms of intellectual property and the application process of what it can offer you as a small business owners or entrepreneurs and startups um, is that it's a, it is accessible. So you will learn today through um, today's presentation, where we will probably cover just the overview of the regional office and USPTO and some of the resources, a lot of the resources that we have for you guys to take advantage of. And Dimple will, at a high level, touch base on what is patents, trademark, copyright, and trade secret. So along with that, uh, we will welcome you. I'll be on the mostly on the back end and supporting any uh, questions uh, that you guys might have. So feel free to use a chat to submit your questions. Again, I will be on the back end to address those questions along with uh, Dimple and Ray. So welcome. Thank you, Jacob. I guess we can get started and you can use the chat feature throughout the presentation as we're presenting to and um, supporting staff will go ahead and answer those questions. At the end, when we have time, we'll go over Q and A's just more verbally. Thank you very much. You can go on to the next slide, Dimple. 
So just to give you an overview of USPTO, we do have about 13,000 employees. We actually are an agency under the Department of Commerce. Uh, so we have about 13,000 employees. Most employees here at USPTO will be PAN examiners. Uh, interesting fact about PAN examiners, they do have to have a technical background to examine in the industry that they operate in. So that is very fascinating because most of PAN examiners, such as like Jacob, and even uh, Dimpo, they both have a history of patent examination and they both have a uh, technical background. Uh, most of them will be engineers. We do have some scientists, chemists and other technical backgrounds, but most of the workforce here at USPTO will have an engineering background. And then we have a good mix of uh, trademark attorneys, which are the trademark examining attorneys that do all the trademark applications. We have about 662 at the end of fiscal year 2021. Our numbers do continue to increase, but just to give you a snapshot of what we were in last fiscal year. We also do handle administrative pan judges and administrative trademark judges within USPTO. Uh, we just to give you an overview of patents that we were able that we received for filing last year was about six hundred and fifty thousand, and about three hundred and seventy four thousand were issued. It doesn't mean that the that the number of the 650,000 were filed or the patents issued. Usually it takes about two to three years to actually get a patent approved. Uh, so it's something just to keep in mind, just the numbers and the production that USPTO operates in. Um, an interesting fact that USPTO, we're actually a fee-based agency. So that means taxpayer money doesn't fund USPTO, but we operate based off the fees that we generate of trademark and patent applications. So that's why you'll see a lot of the mandatory fees throughout the presentation and throughout USPTO. To give you an overview on trademarks, uh, we had about 732 trademark applications last fiscal year and about 337,000 certificates of registration. Gives you a good idea of the production level that we're able to provide throughout the year. Uh, one of the things I've noticed throughout history, USPTO production levels continue to increase, which actually are a good sign of the economy. Uh, it just shows that the intellectual property in the United States continues to grow, uh, which is a good sign. And we do have presentations so where we kind of talk about IP within business. And actually, the next coming presentation that we have with the Alabama FBDC in about two weeks, we'll talk a little bit more on those uh, correlations between IP and, and the growth of economic growth. Um, and down here, you'll see our headquarters in Alexandria, beautiful campus. Um, we were able to expand from the headquarters in uh, from Alexandria, you go on to the next one, Dimple, to the regional office, which we operate now under the Americans Advance Act in 2009. So now we do have more local presence throughout the United States. Each region has its territories. Of course, we are the Texas regional office. And even though it says Texas regional, we do cover uh, eight states, other state southern states, as you can see. Uh, and we're, we're able to operate and uh, educate the public and interact with stakeholders throughout our states. It doesn't mean that we actually do the production side of it, though we don't do the patent and trademark processing uh, for your specific uh, application. Uh, we do more of the outreach side of it, the education and the interaction with the communities. That's just something to keep in mind. We may get it, you know, some of our patent examiners may get your applications, but it doesn't get routed that way. You go on to the next slide, please. So just to kind of show you a little bit of Texas Region Office here in downtown Dallas, we do house PAN examiners, uh, the PAN trial and appeal boards, the PTAB judges, and management and staff such as myself and Jacob. So we should start opening up again. Uh, we should have appointments by, we should have the option to do uh, visits by appointments starting January 1st, I mean, January, June 1st. So we'll, we'll just start opening up back again due to the COVID restrictions that we were under. And if you wanted to visit us, you know, you, you can do the public search facility that we have. Um, and we, we do have examiner interview rooms in case you wanted to do one in person with the patent examiner in the area, uh, hearing rooms and public meeting spaces as well. So it's something to, to take advantage of if you're in the area or you in the you wanted to do more in-person interaction. Of course, because of COVID, we do have the option now to do a lot of the things virtual uh, and we, we always have that option to do one-on-one -on -one consultations with individuals that need further guidance on intellectual property or just how USPTO works, the patent resources side of it. Uh, so it will be definitely uh, something that we start opening again. And, you know, May 25th, the, the official date, and it'll be uh, the appointments and walk-ins for those people that want the 
the in-person interaction. We'll, we'll start bringing that back again. Uh, but as we can see, a lot of the demand has really gone to the virtual side. Um, but we definitely will, will have those two options coming soon. And I'll kind of turn it over to Dimple now to kind of talk about the, the four buckets of IP. And then from there, uh, I'll take over again to talk about resources that USPTO has. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Um, as I said, for better audio, I would like to pause um, my video. So I hope that's okay with everyone. My apology in advance for pausing my video during the presentation. Um, so today we're going to talk about the more in depth about the intellectual property. We will give you some brief overview. What is the intellectual property? So intellectual pro the property is a creator of the property that includes the intangible creations of the human intellect. The main purpose of the intellectual property law is to encourage the creation of a wide variety of intellectual goods. To achieve this, the law gives the people and business property rights to information and intellectual goods they create, usually for the limited period of time. This gives the economic incentives for their creations because it allows the people to benefit from the creations, from the information and intellectual goods that they create and allow them to protect their ideas and prevent from the copying. So in a depth, we will talk about the four buckets of the intellectual property. What are those four buckets? So stay tuned. So as we mentioned, the intellectual property is protected in a law. And um, what are the four buckets of the intellectual property? The first one, the patent. The second one is a trademark. The third one is a copyright. The fourth one is a trade secret. And later in the slides, uh, in the presentations, I will talk more about all these four um, buckets in more detail, give you more information on these four buckets. But I want to just give you some more information on the background information on intellectual property. So the, by striking the right balance between it between the interests of the innovators and the wider public's interest, the IP systems aim to foster an environment in which creativity and innovation can flourish. Here are the four, four examples of the intellectual property are valuable assets of the company and understanding how they work, how they create, they are created is a critical to knowing how to protect them. So everyone has innovation ideas. Sometimes um, I would like to share one example before I start my discussions on a four buckets of the IP. Nowadays, everyone has a mobile device. Without a mobile device, we cannot survive. <laughs> That's my thinking. So when you look at the mobile device, do you think how many intellectual properties is associated with this one device? So if you think of the trademark, how the trademark is associated with this mobile device? So one is a manufacturer name, that is Samsung, and the product name, model name is a Galaxy Note. So those are the trademarks. Now, how is the patent is involved in a mobile device? So if you see the configuration of the mobile device, how they make it, how, what are the materials is involvement, semiconductor chips is involvement, camera, battery, screen, antenna, data processing methods, semicon. So all these things are associated with the patents, utility inventions. So those are the prevented by the patents. Then there is another, besides the utility patents, there is another category of the patent. It's called as a design patents. So how this design pattern is involved with the mobile device. So if you see the, the appearance of the mobile device, if you compare with the Apple device to the Samsung device, it's a very different. One is their curved bezels, the curved screens, then home button shape, all those things is associated with the design patterns and they can be safe, protect them. The third, the fourth one is a copyright how the copyright is involved in a mobile device. So if you have a software code, instruction manuals, ringtone, those are can be protected by the copyrights. And a trade secret, a trade secret is a secret that only the company knows, not anybody else knows. That's why it's called as a trade secret. That's why you can see big question marks here for the trade secrets. 
So now we are jumping to the our first category, first bucket of the intellectual property, and that's the biggest biggest chunk of the intellectual property, and that's called as a patents. What is the patents? What type of different patents you can see, and how? What kind of information you can get from the patent? How you can file for the patent applications? So all this information you will get in this presentation. So. When we think of the patents, to be honest with you, I first learned to know about the patent when I was in my college time frame. Like when I was in a college, when I was doing the research on a nanotechnology, at the time my professor told me, why don't you do the Google patent search about your idea and see if there is any patent available or not. Trust me, that fascinated me so much because I came across chunk of the patents and chunk of the innovative idea that associate with the nanotechnology and how those are nanotechnologies work, what are the products outcomes, how it can be protected by the patents. It fascinated me and that's why you can see me right now here at the patent office because my interest for the patents grow day by day more and more. So that's a, one of the reasons that's why I joined the patent office. So what is the patents? The patent uh, for, for an in invention is the grant of the property right to an inventor issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. The right conferred by the patent grant is the language of the statute and the grant itself, right to exclude other from making, using, offering for sale or selling the inventions in the United States or importing the inventions into the United States. What is granted? What is the granted is not the right to make, use, offer for sale, sell or import, but the right to exclude other from making, using, offering for sale or selling or importing your inventions. So this is the key of getting the patents that it's a right to exclude the other to steal your idea. You can protect your idea. And once the patent is issued, the patentee must enforce the patent without the aid of the USPTO. As I mentioned earlier, there are different categories of the patents. So we have three different types of the patents. One is called the utility patent, second is called design patent, and third is called as a plant patent. In day-to-day -day daily life at the USPTO, we see more filings in the utility patents and the design patents than the plant patents. But let me talk to you about what is the utility patents. So utility patents may be granted to anyone who invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, article of manufacture, or compositions of a matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof. Generally, the, the term of the new patent is up to 20 years from the date on which the application for the patent was filed in the United States subject to the payment of the maintenance fee. U.S. patent grants are effectively only within the United States, U.S. territories, and the U.S. positions. So you have to keep in mind, if you grant the patents, your patents will work only the United States or U.S. territories and the U.S. positions. Outside the United States, you cannot control your patents. However, you need to file your patent applications in other patent office as well in order to get the right in that particular country. The second category is a design patent. So design patent may be granted to anyone who invents a new original and ornamental design for an article of manufacture. The term of a new design patent is 15 years from the date of grant. The third one, Plant patents, so plant patents may be granted to anyone who invents or discover and asexually reproduce any distinct and new variety of plant. The term of a new patent is a 20 years from the date of the filing application. So from here you can see utility patents and plant patents have a benefit of the filing dates and um, you will get up to 20 years. However, design patent, it does not have a filing date a benefit. So what is those benefit of the filing date that I will talk in my, later, uh, in my later presentation? So next one, do you know that Ab Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, Mr. Abraham Lincoln 
is one of the first presidents who has a patent, who hold a patent. So on May 22nd, 1849, Abraham Lincoln received the patent number 6469 for a device to lift the boats over Seoul, an invention which was never manufactured. However, he got his patent, but that patent did not put it in a practice, did not put it in a manufacture. So he was the first US president to hold the patent. So this is the, another example of the design pattern. So here you can see how the design pattern we can achieve. So here is the example of the video console, video game console. So here you see that console's um, appearance, their features, their colors, their up, like a game console's remotes, all these are involved with the design patterns. And we know that design pattern protects the ornamental appearance for an article. This can be shape, configurations, or surface ornamental applied to an article or boat. This is the example of the plant patterns. So plant patterns protect the distinct and new varieties of the plants, such as cultivated sports, mutants, hybrids, and newly found seedings. Isn't this flower is beautiful? So what is the path to patents? How, you, how we get, once we get the innovative idea, how we can involve that things in a patent, how we can receive the patent. So here is the timeline. Here is the process that I would like to share with you. And if you remember in the two slides previously, we, we, we talk about the benefit of the filing date. So here we will talk more about that benefit of the filing date. So let's say you have an innovative idea and you want to prevent the idea and solution of for that invention is that you may want to patent the innovative thoughts or ideas. You may be thinking of the several possible first steps. However, the first and main step is to ensure that your idea is a novel. So in order to do that, just start with a simple internet search. And nowadays, the Google Patents is a great search engine for doing your search with respect to your innovative idea. Also, you have the option of going to the public search room at our regional office, Dallas, Texas office, as well as there are numerous online resources available that you can use to determine if your pursuing patent is actually worth it or not. I'm not going to spend time on um, resources information because in a later presentation, Ray will discuss on our resources, what are the online resources available, what are the resources at the Dallas, Texas regional office are available. So let's focus on our this uh, time part, part to the patterns. So let's say you did all your search, you reach out to the, our regional office, you get the help from our regional office, and then at the end, you think that your innovative idea is a novel, non-obvious, then you may think to prevent the innovative idea by patenting it. And how would you do that? What is the first step? So what is the first step? The first step would be the filing the provisional application. But keep in mind, the provisional application is optional, it's not necessary. But sometimes when you have an idea and your idea is not written perfectly on a piece of paper, but it's just some thoughts you put it on a paper, but you wanna prevent it, by from the others to steal it or others to put it in a practice. So in order to do that, this is a good suggestion, file the provisional applications and the provisional application fee is about the $60 or something. So by doing that, there are two benefits you will get. One, you will get the benefit of the filing date. And then second, you will prevent your idea from others to stealing. And when you file the provisional application, you don't need to have a perfect application. You can have a one or two paragraph of the specification. If you have a drawing handy, you can submit that along with your provisional application with the maintenance fee, and then you can file for a provisional application. But keep in mind, provisional application is valid for one year only. So in a one year, it's allowed that our inventors or our applicant to perfect their applications 
and then they can file for the non-provisional application. And that non-provisional application is known as a utility patent or plant patent application. So let's say you file your provisional application, you got the one year of the time frame, and you file for the non-provisional application. In non-provisional application, there are certain requirements. You need to have a good amount of the specification with the detailed descriptions on your invention. You need to have an abstract. You need to have at least one claim. So see, you see the difference between the provisional application and non-provisional application. Once you file your non-provisional application, then it will route to the appropriate technological centers where the examiners will examine your application. If the examiners do not find any application, any references that match with your innovative idea, you will be granted the patent. And the patent lifeline is 20 years. So you can see filing the provisional application will give you the benefit of the filing date. So next packet is uh, trademarks. What is a trademark? So there are two terms you might be hear more often, trademark, service mark. So trademark is a word name. It's a, sorry, trademark is a word name symbol or design or combination thereof that is used in a trade with a good to indicate the source of the goods and distinguish them from the goods of others. On the other hand, the service mark is the same as a trademark except that it identify and distinguish the source of a service rather than a product. Trader, trademark right may be used to prevent others from using a confusing similar mark, but not to prevent others from making the same goods or from selling the same goods or service under clearly different mark. So you have to keep in mind that what is the difference between the patent and a trademark. Trademark can be maybe used to prevent others from using the conf your similar mark but it's not going to prevent others from making the same goods or selling the same goods or service under a clearly different mark. So just keep in mind those things. Let me give you the example of the McDonald's. Let's say you are passing by the McDonald's, you see the McDonald's um, golden arches, and then so there are trademarks and service markets associated with that franchise. So we know that the quality and consistency should be the same across all the franchises of the McDonald's. The McDonald's name is a service mark for the restaurant service. The golden arches are the trademark logo. McNugget is a trademark product name. So there can be the multiple level of the trademarks and service, mark, service marks within the business. Isn't that fascinating? So that's your second intellectual properties. Let me give you more examples of the trademarks. Here is the examples of the trademarks that the trademark can be the word and the design, such as Starbucks, Nike, Target. Do you know that there are also some marks is known as a non-traditional marks? So that's depending on the trade dress, such as like a product design, packaging, configuration, or the color, sound, sound, taste, touch, and moving images. So those are the examples of the non-traditional marks. Here is the first non-traditional marks is based on the color. The first one you can see Tiffany Blue from the Tiffany & Company. The second one is a brown, is from the UPS. And the third one is the green and yellow color schemes from John Deere. Another example of the non-traditional marks based on the scents. So first one is a strawberry, cherry, and grape lubricants for engine to make your exhaust smells very good. The second one is the flowery must scents in a Verizon store. The third one is a Play-Doh with the scents of the sweet, slight, slightly musky vanilla fragrance with a slight overtone of cherry combined with the smell of a salted wheat-based dough. 
that is just some other non-traditional marks is based on the sounds. We all know the very cute sounds of the filberry dough from, and then second one is the NPC chimes. And the third one is a Mario. You can also add nowadays the Netflix is getting so popular. So Netflix sounds is also known traditional marks. So basically a sound trademark is where the sound is used to perform the trademark function of uniquely identify the commercial's origin of a product or service. Do you remember we talk about the non-traditional marks example in descriptions? One of that is a trade dress. So what is a trade dress? Trade dress must be the distinctive. This means the consumer perceives the particular trade dress as identifying a source of a product. So here, first example is the Dr. Martin's boots. How is it distinct from the other boots? So one is a yellow stitching in the vault area of the sole. The second one is a two-tone grooved sole edge. The third one, the distinct DMS sole pattern. And the fourth and the last one is a black fabric heel loops. So those are the features make the Dr. Martin's boots distinct from the other boots. The second example is a Hershey's Kisses, is a Kisses shapes and the wrapping material, as well as the, you can see a little bit flag out the Kisses um, printout. The third one is a layout of the Apple product store. So when you visit the Apple product store or you visit the Best Buy, you can see how it's a distance. You can see Apple product is a lighting layout as well as the stages is way different than any other stores. The fourth one is the Coca-Cola bottle shape. That's called original trade dress. Our third bucket of the intellectual property is a copyright. So what is a copyright? The copyright is a form of a protection provided by the law of the United States to the authors of original work of authorship. That includes the liter literary, dramatic, musical, artistics, and certain other intellectual works. Copyright is a bundle of the rights that gives the owner the right to make copy, prepare derivative works or modifying their work, distribute the copies, performs the work publicly and display the work publicly. So these are the copyrights examples. So what are the things you can protect it by the copyrights? If you have a songs, you can get the copyrights on your songs. You, if you write the books, you can get the copyrights on your books. Even any particular sounds, you can get the copyrights, movies or sculptures. There is some crossover the, here between the type of the IPs. Here are the list of the works that protected by the copyrights, but the, some of the works that protected by the copyrights that can be protected by the, another category of the intellectual property. Such as, you can see a logo. In a previous slide, we learned about the trademark. So a logo can be protected by copyright or the trademark. Then if you have a methods or process executed by the software care, a code, that may be the patent protected, while the actual source code is a copyright. So you can see from here the list that it can be protected by two different type of intellectual property. It could be the two or more. Whatever you can feel is a convenient for you and it's within the budget. The last Category of our last category of our intellectual property is a trade secrets. What is a trade secrets? So trade secrets consist of the information and can include the formula, patterns, compilations, programs, device, method, technique, or process. So you can see the trade secret can consist on any information that you can have. To meet the most common definition of a trade secret, the information must be used in a business and give an opportunity to obtain an economic advantage over the competitors who do not know or use it. So this is the keywords. The trade secret is just only the company knows about it. Others, competitors 
do not know or do not use it. If they don't know it, how are they going to put it in a practice? It's all the company's responsibility to keep that secret to them. Here is the small table that we prepare for the patent versus the trade secrets, how the patents and trade secrets are really different sides of the same coins. Um, such as the patent you get from the 20 patents can last the 20 years from the filings. On the other hand, trade secrets can last as long as it remains secrets. If your secret is out, people's going to know about it and then people's going to start to make it or use it. Then in a patent, you may disclose how to make use your invention within your, your application on a on trade secret. It's all about the secret because it's, you have to take the reasonable step, steps to keep your trade secret secure. So these are the basically comparisons between the patents and trade secrets. So, and these are the examples of the what are the trade secrets. So first is a Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola's formula is a classic Coke and nobody knows how they make it, but tastes really good. The second one is a KFCs. So KFCs, 11 herbs and spice is a trade secret. Even head chef at the KFC claimed that he doesn't know what are those 11 herbs and spices that KFC use. The third one is the Krispy Kremes. Krispy Kreme um, got it started in 1937 when Vernon Rudolph bought a secret yeast raised donuts recipe from a French chef from New Orleans. The fourth one is a Google page rank is a hybrid in that original formula for scoring link is subject to a patent protection. However, how Google combat manipulations of its page rank algorithm by link farms and other tools is closely held secret by the company. So you can see those things. Here is the table we call as a cheat chat, um, cheat -chat table. So basically here it gives you the all the utility intellectual property information. It has a patent, trade secret, copyrights, and trademark. It will also give you some handy information. What is protected? What are the requirements? What is this protect against? What is the endures until and what the rights of independence creators? So you can see here from this table. This table is very hand, handy for the people who are new to the intellectual property, who are like you know, in, inventor and they have an innovative idea and they don't know anything about this intellectual property. So this table is very handy, useful for them. So now I would like to hand over to um, Ray to, to talk more about the USPTO resources. So Ray, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dimple. Jacob and I have been keeping busy here with the questions. Good to see from the, the public. Um, you can go on to the next slide. I'll be talking about USPTO resources, something that would definitely help you in your entrepreneurship process. A lot of people don't know, but we definitely do provide resources for the community and really to help foster innovation. <clears throat> really, uh, the number one uh, resource that we have is our USPTO website. Uh, what, the, we do put everything that we try uh, to put, every, we try to put everything that we have for the public knowledge uh, into our website. So in there, you can find information on intellectual property. I know some of the questions here, uh, we, we're getting straight from our uh, website, just public answers, maintenance fees. Uh, that's, a, that's a big question people ask, you know, the protection of a patent and trademark. Something just to keep in mind, it can go up to 20 years for a trademark and patent. But there's also maintenance fees that go throughout the years. And we can put the, that information in the chat so you can reference it and really understand um, to be able to keep up with those fees to keep them registered. And, and that really happens because uh, every industry is different, uh, especially in the technology area. Sometimes you may not need the 20 year protection because it may surpass the actual lifetime that you need a patent for. So just keep that in mind that there are uh, patent and trademark fees out there. Uh, we do have a website dedicated for startup resources. 
So definitely uh, for startup businesses or even new businesses, I would definitely recommend to look into our website for, for startup resources, just so you can definitely see an overview of, of resources, state and local resources, pro se uh, applications, which are self-representing individuals. I know that was one of the questions in the chat. Um, you know, it's it's always recommended to get an IP attorney just because they they know the learning curve, they they know the process itself. But you do always have the option to represent yourself. So in there, you'll see some links. Uh, a big one is the scam prevention. There are uh, organizations out there that uh, pose to be the USPTO. So it's good for you as the public uh, to understand some of the scams out there, so you're not being taken advantage of. Uh, and, and there's other assistants that direct you to the SBA per se and, and state and local as well. You can go on to the next slide, uh, Dimple. It's, it's a good uh, one-stop shop there for startup resources and new businesses, really. We do have 1-800 hotlines as well. And these are the Trademark Assistance Center for trademarks and the patent. Uh, and for patents, we have the Inventors Assistance Center. And both 1-800 uh, hotlines uh, are there for you to um, assist you in the process of trademarks and, and patents. So it, it's uh, any question that you may have, uh, the legal community uses this quite a bit from paralegals to attorneys, uh, just to uh, be able to navigate through the patent and trademark uh, system and just ask general questions as well. So this is something that I continue to hear great things about and I'm happy um, that that, that's, that's the case, really. It just shows how, how good the customer service is, is being uh, provided there. And you, you can also see an email there for the Trademark Assistance Center. <clears throat> uh, next uh, slide, please. And the sec next slide is the Inventor Assistance Center, which is more focused on the patent side. Like I said, anything that you may have any questions on the process itself or general qu uh, questions, the patent examiners uh, doing the Inventor Assistance Center can assist you with. Uh, and both of them, they won't be able to give you legal advice, just keep that into consideration, but they definitely help you and guide you where you need to be. Um, there is a profile you can create through USPTO once you start doing uh, trademark applications. It's something that we definitely recommend you create. Uh, they're just easier to navigate the system. You can file the application from here and you can do responses. Um, from here as well and anything any short links that you may need for in the process such as change of address you can put in here as well uh, next slide please we do have an app it's a little bit more accessible uh, for trademark status in case you you want to keep up uh, just a little bit more accessible for individuals and you go on to the next slide as well and this is something that um, well the ip awareness tool the ip awareness tool is something that we provide for uh, business advisors and really just general public to be able to put your knowledge of IP uh, into a questionnaire. So the questions will pretty much help you understand intellectual property best, which really as an entrepreneur, small business owner, you want to uh, understand it because every situation is different. And you'll, you'll see some overlap on trademarks, copyright, just you may see some that they hit, can hit all of them, you know, patents and even trade secrets. It can be a combination. And ultimately, you want to understand each bucket to better protect yourself and your idea. Um, sometimes, you know, you may just decide, you know what, this is better just to keep to myself and do it a, a trade secret. Or you may actually find a combination of, you know, copyrights and trademarks and um, trade secrets. So it's, it's, it's best for you to understand so you can know how to, to protect yourself. Uh, the pro bono program is one of the more or uh, popular programs that we have at USPTO, we do recognize that it can become costly to uh, get patent drafting fees covered. So keep in mind that we do have pro bono programs throughout the United States, coverage in every 50 states. And the USPTO certifies these organizations so they can give pre bono, pro bono assistance for patent um, drafting fees. So you, there's still some requirements you do have to follow. You still have to pay USPTO filing fees and costs. But like I said, we are a fee-based agency, so just keep that into consideration. There are some incentives for small businesses, which I'll talk about later. You do have to have an income of 300% below federal poverty guidelines. Some regions do differ, but in general, you're looking at about 300%. Some of them I've seen at 200%, so you always want to check with your pro bono organization. Uh, and then you have to demonstrate a knowledge of the patent system. And you can do this by taking a course at our in our, in our website. Uh, at uspto.gov 
uh, and then have a you know, provisional application already on file with USPTO. And the organization, the pro bono organization, will have to have a application pre-screened just to make sure it's more than an idea, something more feasible uh, that you can actually go after. You go to the next slide, please. And here you'll see the coverage of the USPTO pro bono programs. Uh, for Alabama, you, you guys do have uh, the Birmingham Lawyers, I think it's called, um, I forget, BBVLP patent program which falls under Alabama. So it's definitely something that you want to take advantage of if you feel you can qualify for, because like I said, it can help you with the, the legal fees itself. Uh, there are, you go to the next slide. The other pro bono program uh, are law school clinics. There isn't one particular in Alabama, but you can always reach out to the surrounding states to see if they cover the Alabama area. The USPTO law schools are certified through USPTO to give, uh, free or pro bono assistance on legal um, fees, which would be the trademarks and patents. So they, they are law school students that are going through the IP um, law school within in their areas. And they are supervised by a, a faculty clinic supervision supervisor that has IP experiences certified through USPTO. Uh, so it, it's good, it's a good win-win for the students. They're actually learning they get to apply it and the small business gets to take advantage of, of the pro bono assistance. Uh, this is a good map of the law schools throughout the US. Like I said, you can always reach out to the neighboring uh, states around you to see if they cover the Alabama area. Uh, next slide, please. We do have PTRCs and we do have in Alabama, several PTRCs or a couple. Uh, and the PTRCs are patent and trademark resource centers. So usually step one for patents and trademarks is, is always to do the search. You wanna make sure that that patent or trademark is not already out there. Uh, so the searching can become complicated. So what USPTO does, they, we train librarians throughout the United States to be able to assist you in this, these searches. They're specified searches on patents and trademarks and they can assist you um, to help you find any prior art or just to make sure this mark or, or idea isn't already registered with the USPTO. So that's always uh, good to, to really understand once you have the idea is to, to do some research behind it. Um, we do have an option of uh, prioritizing your patent examination. So it's called track one. You do have to pay a little bit extra for it, but it is an option individuals have in case they wanna expedite the process. So next slide, please. We do have error forms as well. So these are what we recommend, especially if you're trying to convey a message to your patent ex examiner. Um, a patent should always be a new and innovative and non-obvious. So uh, if you're trying to convey that into paper, it's, it's not usually not the easiest thing to do. So what we recommendations are and best practices are to do error forms, which would do the interviews with patent examiners, that patent examiners is actually dealing with your application and you can have a one-on-one -on -one and talk to them and be able to convey your message a little bit better. Uh, so we do see an increase of uh, applications uh, being approved uh, with uh, patent examiner interviews. So I always keep that into consideration as an option. We do have a patent ombudsman program in case there's any issues in your patent process. Uh, we typically don't have uh, issues to for the ombudsman program, but it's good for you to know that there is a, a um, organization here within USPTO that can help you get your application back on track and serve as a, a third party per se. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is the micro entity status I was talking about, the incentives for small businesses. So USPTO considers uh, small businesses or micro entity status, um, the proper definition, to be fewer than 500 employees. So you, you do get incentives such as 75% off most patent fees, low cost submission to establish filing dates. And you do have to fall under the, the requirements of the 500 employees, fewer than 500 employees and not be named as an inventor on more than four previously filed applications. So we, we definitely wanna see new people into the system. We have noticed that once people come into the system and go through the learning curve, they tend to use the, the USPTO system a lot more. And there is a, a gross income requirement, as you can see, three times the medium household income, uh, not exceeding. And um, you can't, it, it also loops in that you can't be assigned or granted or conveyed in four previously other 
a patent. So I was going to keep that in mind, but typically, you know, if you're a small business and you're new to the system and you meet the household income requirement, you would be able to qualify on the micro entity status. Um, and then the next slide is more our information here at the Texas Regional Office. We definitely like to talk to inventors, the small business community, and give them our time to guide them to, to best use the USPTO system, the protection that we have. Um, we won't be able to give you legal advice, like I mentioned earlier, but we definitely like assisting you and guiding you where you need to be. Sometimes it's just me educating you on a particular subject. Sometimes it may be uh, directing you to a resource that's nearby you. Um, so definitely feel free to give us a call and send us an email and we'll make sure to take our time and, and guide you as best as we can. I know there's been a lot of activity in the chat, so I'll definitely I'll open it up for any questions right now, any questions that we haven't answered. All right, well, I do wanna thank everyone for submitting uh, a lot of your questions. So I'm excited that some of you guys are real, really well informed in terms of intellectual property. So I'm gonna sort of, uh, I left some room for us to address some of these questions. I'm gonna go back to, let's see, Shamiko. My apologies if I'm not saying your correct, correct uh, name correctly. And the question is, what's some, what is some examples of educational information you can have copyright? Uh, examples of workshops, seminars, information, and books. So um, if you guys remember what Dimple has mentioned when she was going over the copyright topic is that really the any time in terms of any of you guys start, you know, writing or creative work in terms of any writing the materials, education materials, at that point, you essentially have a copyright uh, protection. In terms of enforcement, then you do want to go uh, with uh, you know copyright office, which is not our office, but you can file those applications. And once uh, once approved, that adds uh, your ability to kind of enforcement uh, enforce your copyright protection. And Ray, I think you're sharing your email right now. You might not want to do that. And so. Um, what I would say is that, so anytime the, there is a, uh, if any of you guys are creating any sort of a creative work that could be music or um, education material, any material in terms of a creative work in a tangible media, uh, if you're seeking a, a enforcement side to that, then certainly uh, go after the copyright protection. So I hope that answers that question. And after that, um, let me see, I think I did skip. Uh, some of this. I believe Karen, sorry, Karen, it took a long time for, I, I thought this, this question uh, will be probably better suited for a verbal explanation. So. First of all, congratulations. Your so, sounds like you're working on your maybe first uh, patent application. So it's a lot involved. So I think uh, when you, so first of all, what I will mention is that we actually have a brand new search engine that is available in a public manner. So maybe Ray and Dimple can give you that link where you can actually go online at home and, and perform a patent search. This is a brand new tool that we are offering. And this is a similar to uh, the tool that our patent examiners would use. The only exception is that it does not include the international uh, patent search. So that's the exception there. Uh, but otherwise it's the very same tool. So feel free to you know, conduct some search with the keywords and classification search. I won't get into details of that, but there it is also on our website and in terms of how to, uh, in terms of using that tool uh, at home. So take a look at that. And when you look at these patent documents, I would say that um, you will notice there is some structure to the patent document, which you have already mentioned. So abstract, description of the invention, prior uh, background of the inventions and those kind of things, drawings and claims and whatnot. Those are the kind of necessary components for filing a patent application. And you stated that there, you see some redundancy and whatnot. 
So essentially what I would say is kind of learn from other patents been issued, right? And how they have described their work product or brand new ideas or a modification thereof or improvements thereof and really learn from that. And, and I would just put it in a very short way. It, um, as Dimple mentioned earlier about when you file for a patent application, it's actually, the, it's a total different concept when it comes to um, the trade secret, right? So you are letting the public know of your invention in a form of a, form of a disclosure. So think of it as a sort of a manual, uh, if you will. So if you purchase any of the products, uh, maybe it's a, you know, sometimes a lot of the, a lot of times these days, like your phone may be not, not a good example, but when you buy, purchase a product, it comes with the directions and how to use and just describing what the device is, is right? You remember those days, think of it as a, maybe an Ikea furniture. It's just a bunch of drawings, but you can kind of make the device on your own. So think of your patent application as disclosing and how to make and use your invention. So you want to fully describe uh, your invention that way. So I hope that makes sense. So it's a sort of a manual, if you will. And I think I turn. I'm going to turn it over to maybe Dimple and Ray to see if there are any other questions that we need to address. No, I think you address all the questions. Um, there was a last question that. Mr. Escort has, does a buying a web website domain in advance give you inside track on getting trademark? The last one. Well, I, I don't think the buying a domain will give you a trademark protection and, and it's a separate track, right? Domain means that you purchase a domain so that you can, using that address, web address, and now you can upload whatever the content that you wish. Now. The content that you make it publicly available, that's related to the copyright, right? So in terms of, I talked uh, earlier about if you want to enforce the content within that exists within your website, then certainly you could file for copyright protection. In terms of trademark, that's kind of the branding. So if you're going after your website is tied to your business goods and services that may exist in commerce, then you could have that and you have to file for the trademark application to have the enforcement side for your branding or your logo and your business. And hope that answers that question. The last one is from Mr. Williams. If my trademark application is abandoned, can I react to it to compete, compete it or do I have to start the process all over again? So I'm a little confused about the reactivation. So when it comes to trademark, anytime you have a service and goods that exists in the commerce, and that is in fact, the point of the trademark, if you somehow, uh, let's say hypothetically, I'm not sure this is what you're getting at, um, have let go of that business, you're no longer using it, then trademark does not exist, right? Um, but in that case, then if you want to revive your business, maybe a few years down the road, then you have to, again, file for that trademark again, just making sure that no one else is actually using that sort of a, your, your name or branding or the logo and the like. Um, if you're talking about a application itself that was filed and it was uh, not approved and it was rejected and you are trying to revive that, and, and certainly the trademark examining attorney will help you uh, with that process. Maybe they need, uh, you, you may need to do some tweaking or changes to the word itself, the, the company name itself to a branding or the logo, uh, but they will help you with that process. But if it's rejected, if someone else is already using that name, then uh, I would say that uh, unfortunately you have to really kind of go back to the drawing board and then come up with a new branding. And this is actually, if I can turn it around and say this, one of the benefits of filing for the trademark application is that before you get so deep into the, the companies that and the, the name or the branding that you're going after by filing the trademark application, you know uh, that by doing so, there isn't any conflict or uh, public won't be confused about your name or your branding and your logo, right? If you get it accepted, that means that there won't be any confusion when you go out to the marketplace with your company's uh, name. 
Thank you, Jacob. And not only that, in our chat window, I provided us some links information with respect to the patents. Like if you need to know more information on a patents or trademarks on these links, they will give you information of how the patent examination process work, what is the time frames, what is the trademark examination process then. And um, I'm not a trademark examiner, but I'm a patent examiner. But I, I know that if the patent examiner application is get abandoned, applicant ha cannot revoke that applications and then continue send back to the examination. But applicant can take the benefit of the filing and then reapply for the applications. But for further information for the trademark, I would definitely suggest to reach out to our online resources that would and these resources for the trademark is a trademark attorney who can guide you proper way and give you more information in depth if you need it and some of the information if we might not convey in this discussion but definitely i would suggest to use online resources that we have and I also put the link for the public um, search assistance page where you can get the help of the do the online search before you file your patent applications or trademark application. Um, that's a Jacob was mentioning how that public search assistance page will help to the our external users. Um, Jacob, if you don't mind, there was another one last questions that we have from Mr. Williams Williamson's. Uh, the person is asking that I send these questions in advance and we apologize that we did not answer you earlier. So if I protect manual copyright, is it still protected if I modify? And um, like a, the manual is like operational manuals or hiring process. Um, okay, so that's a great question. I would wonder the same, right? If you make some changes to um, your copyrighted item um, in a tangible media, so what, you know, I am not an expert in copyright, so I would probably have maybe Dimple and Ray send you a link to the copyright office. Um, there might be, I'm not 100% sure, there might be a process where you could amend uh, your copyrighted items to see if you can make such change and still be protected. I, I am not 100% familiar with that process. I'm not even sure if that process even exists. So um, that's one thing. We do. And I do want to just... go back to real quick, uh, Ray. Go ahead. Um, there was a question about, uh, Brian, I believe, had a question about patent agents helping with the trademark application. So that's very specific questions. What I would do is a lot of times patent attorneys may do both patent work and trademark work. So I'll send a link here in the chat. Uh, where you guys can actually check out all the registered uh, patent practitioners and IP practitioners uh, before USPTO. And you can there find some of the, you know, even narrow it down to the area or the state or the, even the city and who may be near you and help you with the filing or helping with the filing of patent application or trademark application. And I'm not, I don't believe uh, agents can, that they do not have a law degree. So the, I'm not sure they can support you or help you with the trademark application they might be able to but i think that's kind of crossing the gray area we have a last questions and the question is that if i have a podcast and a website and make a statement all rights reserved is it my copyright so similar to the trademark somebody asked a question about using the tm and, and this, your bona fide attempt that you are gonna file for the trademark application. So you can think of it the same way for the copyright. So when you see a C in a circle, that means it's copyrighted. And if you are seeing um, that you, you are gonna attempt to, you're, bona, you're gonna intend to file for the copyright protection, that, that I assume that's something that you can do by marking those, uh, your web pages. And we can definitely get you subject matter experts, especially on trademarks and copyrights. If you do a request, if you send us an email, um, especially for copyrights, you know, we do have a different copyrights office agency that deals strictly with copyrights. But we do have subject matter experts here at USPTO that I can help coordinate a one on one meeting with. And that way they can kind of give you more guidance uh, without giving you the legal advice, but definitely more guidance on these specific copyright questions. So feel free to take advantage of that, that service.
and we will give you this presentation slides materials to everyone mm -hmm. so basically in that one you will have all the resources information so you can definitely take advantage of the um, our resources uh, that available online or in person as a um, Ray mentions that our office is starting back to business in person on May 25th so you can make an um, um, appointment with us and I'll share the email link. It, it was the one in the last slide, but I'll share it here in the chat. Uh, Michael did also share the upcoming IP within business strategy webinar that we have coming up on May 18 with the Alabama SPDC network. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks and just teach you a little bit more of uh, how to use IP within a business strategy. And I would like to say to uh, Williamson's that um, if you need more information on a copyright, Ray provided the email address in a chat window. Please send us the email and we can coordinate the meeting with you and the copyright experts. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much for Thank logging you. in today. A uh, special thanks to the team at USPTO for taking time out of their day to talk with us. A great conversation in the chat great information, exactly what we were looking for. Uh, thank you all so much. And to our participants, thank you all for taking time out of your day to learn what you can do to start protecting your IP and, and growing, leveraging your IP and growing your small business. Uh, we hope that you will take a few time, take a few minutes to uh, let us know how we did. You'll get a survey afterwards. And then we look forward to hopefully seeing uh, some of y'all again on May 18th for our next uh, IP webinar. Uh, Thank you all so much. And with that, I think we'll conclude our webinar. Thank you, Michael. See you guys. Yep. Bye.